that frankly needs no introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Montel Williams. Good morning. Um, a lot of you may not know, but this company probably would not have this session here on medical cannabis unless I got involved in cannabis 20 years ago. Long before it was Vogue, long before it was a gold rush, green rush, long before anybody even cared about anybody thinking about can cannabis as a medical substance, I was busted in this country and the entire industry turned its back on me. So that's back in 2000. Why was I busted? It was because, you know, in 1998, I got diagnosed, well, honestly, in 1998, I had a medical emergency that sent me into ICU and critical care for about a month. I was very quiet and depressed, I knew about it. I had a very bizarre form of aneurysm that left me almost to the point that I didn't make it out. But seven months later, I got diagnosed with MS. And when I was diagnosed with MS, the MS began at about that literally sent me into a form of neuropathic pain that I had never experienced in my life before. Um, and a pain that was so severe that when I wrote my book, Climbing Higher, I wrote about it, I, I attempted to take my life three times. On the third time, the only thing that stopped me was the fact that my children went down the hallway. So I immediately, of course, seen some of the top doctors in the world back then. And that's doctors from the Nobel Institute, doctors from Harvard, from Yale, from UC San Francisco, from USC, all of whom thought that the best frame of action and the best uh, way to treat my neuropathic pain back then was to get me addicted to as many opioids as they could. And let's, let's explain, this is back in 2000, long before most of you in this room even knew what the oxycodone was. Because back then they were giving out drugs that were called Tauwin, which is about one molecule off of heroin. So, uh, a drug that I literally, at some points in time, took four or five of them in a day. Over about a year and a half of taking enough opioids that it almost shut down my kidneys, my liver, back before we even were discussing how terrible the, play, the, the, the scourge of opioids were. I went to the doctor who was one of the doctors that I was actually shopping through. And remember, this is 2000, let's put this in perspective. You know, I'm a celebrity who could literally call any doctor in the country and they would write me a prescription for morphine drip if I wanted it in my hotel room. So I went to see the main doctor who was I was using it in my, my supplier, and he didn't know that, but he had called a couple of my friends, and I went in to see him, and he said, you're done. I'm never writing another script. If I do, I'm gonna kill you, because the script itself would kill you. So he suggested to me, then this is in 2000, that I, 2001, he said, listen man, I know some other people with MS, and I've heard that this marijuana stuff works, and I'm not gonna say what hot work, the university was from, was from a very prestigious university, said, and I'm never going to tell anybody that I said this to you, but if I were you, I'd try to figure out how to do this with marijuana and not with opioids. So since that day, there has not been a day that has passed in my life that I have not consumed the cannabis product. And long before the Dr. Sanjay Gupta television special which identified CBD and everybody started going nuts. All CBD, all CBD, all CBD. I was hunting out CBD strains back in 2002 and trying to do a chemical extraction, an O2 extraction in my apartment complex, in my apartment in Manhattan by delivering you know, 100 gallon oxygen tanks in my apartment. I had security had to come up and remove my building because I knew I was going to end up blowing the building up. So long before it was Vogue, this is where I've been, but since then what I've committed to is when I realized how much relief I was able to get from cannabinoids, I made it and have made it my life's mission to ensure that every patient out there in the country who can utilize this as a medication has free access 
about four years ago, I have a daughter who, unfortunately and fortunately, I say unfortunately, was diagnosed with extreme case of lymphoma. She was treated, told to be cured. And then about five months later, it came back. With vengeance, a vengeance so much so that she ended up having to have a stem cell transplant and uh, had to go through all the chemo and radiation that literally walked in a room, named recognize her. And I remember the doctor saying to me when I looked into the face, he said, I don't want you to put any more of this crap in her body. He said to me, you have no say in this. She's 25 years old. She's the patient. You're nothing more than the dad. Even though it was my insurance that was paying for it. And fortunately, because of Obamacare, she was able to stay on my, my insurance, and that's what actually saved her life. And I remember thinking about this and going, no, wait, isn't this kind of crazy? I don't have a right to a conversation about the medication going into my child's body. Yet everybody in this country has put their two cents into whether or not I have the right to use the medication that saved my life. And I find it even just ridiculously appalling that even now to this day, we're still debating when science has now proven unequivocally all over the world that cannabinoids work, period. It's not that we think they work, it's not like we need to do 10 or 15 more clinical trials and studies and spend another four or five hundred million dollars. We know they work. And if I couldn't have and be a part of the conversation with the chemo drugs that they were sticking in my daughter, how dare anybody be a part of the conversation of what I use in my body? I mean, again, if a doctor is trained to do no harm and they take an oath, and that doctor recommends that you use cannabinoids, how dare anybody else say that I don't have a right to do so? Yet with cannabis, we seem to think that we all have a right to be a part of that conversation. So I'm now a part of it. I've been a part of the industry, and we'll stay a part of this industry until this industry is legitimized and made legal. Enough so that I literally, after searching out strains and searching out cannabis, and buying it in the markets where there's legal medication, I was so appalled by how adulterated it is with chemicals and other guys that I've been twice down the road of starting a cannabis company, but in the last two years I've now formed my own company, which is a company that is has developed broad strain and broad range cannabinoids. Instead of just using, you know, again, I'm one of the only people in the world who has interviewed Dr. Meshulam in his laboratory in Israel. And when I interviewed him almost 10 years ago, again, before it became the gold rush, Dr. Meshulam looked me in the face and said, cannabinoids work in an orchestra effect, entourage effect. How dare people try to take it or try to play Tchaikovsky without drums? How can you play Beethoven without strings? You may be able to make music, but it's not going to be Beethoven. So how dare we think that there's only two of the 69 cannabinoids that have been identified so far that are of any value? And so what I've done is develop a broad spectrum cannabinoid medication that includes some that you're going to hear about within the next three or four months, CBG, CBN, THCA, THCB, all those other cannabinoids that literally have just as important an effect as the medication as the single CBD THC that people are trying to hawk right now. And that broad spectrum cannabinoid is now available. And originally, I titled my company Lenitive Labs. And the reason why is because if you look at the word Lenitive, it was a term that was used in the turn of the century on almost all medications that were prescribed in this country because it means assuaging pain, lessening pain. But realizing now that since my formulations have been in the marketplace, people are ordering it as, I need more of that Montel. 
So what we are doing in the, in the last two weeks, we have now changed the name of the brand name of our product over to Montel. So I have a broad spectrum THC included cannabis product, but I also have a CBD product that is now available across the country and has been getting some pretty rave reviews because not only are we focusing on the cannabinoids, but I'm also, what I'm hoping the doc's gonna talk about here, is focusing on the terpenes, and not just the terpenes because I want it to smell nice and want it to taste good, focusing on the terpenes that have been identified for the last 20 to 30 years as having medicinal value in helping to enter and permeate the cell wall. And as we know now, and we discovered, and I'm gonna talk about it in my keynote, the fact that we now in science and worldwide has recognized that we have always had a sympathetic nervous system called the endocannabinoid system that is life for being impacted by the full spectrum. That's the product that I'm doing right now. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I really don't know how I'm going to follow that, but uh, <laughs> I will give it a try. 100% um, agree with on the terpenes, by the way. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but. Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. Um, so I'm Dr. Robert Flannery. I have a PhD in plant biology with an emphasis in environmental horticulture and a specific expertise in hydroponic crop optimization for cut flower production from UC Davis, which I'm very proud to say was just recently voted by US News and World Report as the number one plant science school on the planet. Number two for ag science, but we'll get logging to get the University out of Hall next year, I think. Um, but uh, I've uh, worked in this industry for about six years now, which in cannabis years is, it's like dog years. It uh, goes by you know, seven years for every one year type of thing. But I'm the former production director at Spark in San Francisco, which at least at the time was the largest vertically integrated dispensary in the state of California. Um, when I first got into the industry, I came to find out that uh, I'm the first PhD in the United States uh, with the expertise to be growing commercial cannabis to be doing so. Um, I also found out that three letters behind my name would precede me sometimes, and people say, hey, there's a plant nerd in the industry now, and you know, we have questions. And so I've done a lot of consulting on, uh, in farms, uh, on and around farms uh, throughout the state and throughout the United States, actually. Um, and very quickly came to realize that uh, cannabis cultivation is behind the times. Um, and, and I understand why. I mean, I remember when I was working my PhD, uh, we would have, you know, people come in, UC Davis as a public university, and anyone can walk on campus, they come to the greenhouse, and I'm doing hydroponic research. Well, the majority of cannabis is grown hydroponically. And so people really want to see what the, the cutting edge research was and what we were doing. And on a regular basis, we had cannabis growers coming in. And you know, my professor and I would always say, look, well, would you like us to go to your farm and help you out? I'm like, oh no, 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 please don't come to our farm. And we obviously knew what they were growing. Um, and for some reason, I've never heard this since then, but this was back in 98, 99. They'd say, well, we grow French basil. I, I've never heard cannabis called French basil, but now it's like kind of an inside joke for for myself and a couple of other people, but French basil is what they'd always say that they were growing. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, when I was a, a production director at Spark, I uh, remember this call very distinctly because I was in the dry cure space at Spark, literally surrounded by a ton of cannabis, um, and my mom called to let me know that she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. Um, she has the BRCA1 uh, mutation, which makes it more likely to have uh, a types of cancers like this. Luckily, they caught it very early. She is currently cancer-free. She's still with us. Um, thank you, I very much appreciate that. Um, but when she was going through a chemo and radiation therapy, I, you know, I said, hey, mom, I can offer you some cannabis products to, to help you get through this. Um, you have to understand, my parents have been married since 1971 or 72, I forget. I should probably learn that. Um, but uh, my, my dad has seen my mom drunk two times in that, in that amount of time. So this is not a woman who likes to inebriate herself. Um, she was invited to a pot party in the 60s in college. Literally thought she was going to a Tupperware showing party. This is how naive my mom is when it comes to cannabis. That, that literally happened, I'm not even joking, that did happen. And so when I talked to my mom, I said, mom, I can provide you with cannabis to help you get through this. She said, okay. 
but uh, I don't want to smoke it, I don't want to vape it, I want to eat it. And everything I'd been growing for Spark was all smokables and vapables, um, which meant I was going to have to go source some cannabis and edible form for her. Um, you know, I've done enough consulting to realize and understand that people are putting plant growth regulators and pesticides on this medicine and basically turning that medicine into poison. And so I was thinking to myself, am I about to poison my mom? And uh, it was basically, it was a dis difficult task to try to find uh, an edible group and company that uh, was as stingy as I am when it comes to putting these types of compounds on the plants. Um, luckily, I was able to provide my mom with edibles, and uh, it helped her immensely. Um, but also, it's uh, you know, after she went through chemo radiation therapy and her two rounds of sur surgery, she had anxiety issues. You know, every time she goes to the doctor now, she thinks she's going to get that diagnosis again, and she's having trouble sleeping, which is honestly why we, I created a, a, a product for her. It's called Mom's Formula. And it's a, a microdosing CBD and THC. I use, like you said, I use distillates, no isolates here. Entourage effect is a real thing, and um, you know, there are actually 113 known cannabinoids now. So it's, uh, it's it, there's 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 a lot of a lot of these cannabinoids, and and we're just now breaking the surface to understand what they do beyond what THC and CBD CBD can do. And so I provided you know my mom with this tablet. Um, and basically it helps her sleep at night. It's a very strong anti-anxiety. It's not meant to get you high. It's just kind of bring you down a notch. Um, you know, I, I personally uh, had an issue with neuropathy as well. Um, you know, you might, I don't know if you guys don't recognize this, but I, I played football in college. Um, big guy. Um, and you know, I also, um, uh, as my wife calls me at Clydesdale, I've run three marathons. And just when you're running marathons at 275 pounds, <laughs> not good on the back. So I had an L4, L5 microdiscectomy, and um, neuropathy is a fundamentally real, real thing. And uh, I've never contemplated suicide, but if there was no way I could deal with that pain, that, that would be an option on the table. I, I definitely recognize how that's an issue. Um, when I went to the, the hospital for this, um, the doctor, the ER doctor was like, well, you know, what are you using? And I said, well, you've given me the, the Norco, it does nothing. Um, I'm popping ibuprofen like it's candy. In fact, when we played football in college, we used to call it uh, O-lineman candy. I used to pop them before the games. And uh, now I'm using cannabis. And I said, that's the only thing that works. And the ER doc immediately assumed I was just there to get a prescription for, for opiates or something, for painkillers. And so she, she said, okay, like, hey, well, you know, I don't want to hear about you popping your, your, your O-lineman candy. And, um, and then so she walked out and basically my wife was sitting there and the nurse comes in and says, we're gonna discharge you. And you know, I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand. And uh, the doctor said, well, she doesn't believe that you need, any, you need anything for your pain. Um, they're gonna discharge me. My wife started crying, basically saying, listen, my husband's been home from a football game with a broken nose and he refused to take any ibuprofen or Tylenol. I think something's going on here. And uh, they eventually had to get an MRI lined up, and they put, put me into surgery immediately the next morning. They bumped three surgeries to get me in because it was so bad. Um, cannabis is the only thing that worked in helping me. Um, so, you know, I, I feel very fortunate to have the three letters behind my name to be working in an industry that is burgeoning um, when it comes to cultivation technology, and that's, that's really my expertise, is, is integrating technology into horticulture. Um, and uh, overall, I'm just a, a big nerd uh, when it comes to all these things. I like to learn as much as I can. Um, and, and secondly, I'm very honored to be sitting between these two very distinguished gentlemen and honored to be uh, asked here today. But that's more or less my story. I'm sure there's more I can talk to about, but I want to bore everyone, and I'll just hand it over. So thank you. Hi, my name is, <clears throat> my name is Dean Holter. Um, I'm the sterile, boring attorney up here. Um, so I grew up in San Francisco, uh, and then I went to UC San Diego down here, and then I went to University of San Francisco School of Law. And I have worked as a general counsel. I work with Josh as a general counsel. I also do consulting work for Montel's company, Lemtiv. 
Um, and the way I was going to present myself was going to be a pretty sterile introduction, uh, a typical lawyerly, this is what I do and this is my credentials. But I'm always inspired by people who have a personal story. I think um, the people who are driving the industry are those with real passion. And I didn't know I was going to say this, um, so this is kind of throwing out the script. But again, I'm inspired by people who have their own stories. Um, I'm from San Francisco, but we've had an old fishing cabin up in Humboldt County in Northern California for a hundred years. It's very remote. Humboldt County is known as kind of the Napa Valley of cannabis. Um, so I've spent part of every year of my life in the backwoods of Humboldt County. <coughs> the San Francisco kid up in the backwoods of Humboldt County. I will just say that I have witnessed firsthand when people say in our industry that the war on drugs has been a disaster, that, is, that it has uh, had a negative effect on people and families. Um, it's very true. And that's, I didn't know I was gonna say this, but my sister was a graduate student at Humboldt State University. She was gonna be a, uh, she was getting an advanced degree in uh, marine biology. She'd already started a fish hatchery on the Klamath River to help restore the, the fish populations on the river. She was a very passionate, great person. She went running out in the forest, the redwood, the beautiful redwood forest right next to the, um, right next to Humboldt State University. And she went missing. And I got the call, I was here at UC San Diego my first year and I got the call. Danielle didn't come home. <clears throat> Turns out she was killed in the woods by a guy who was hiding in the woods because he had killed two Indian, Native American Indian teenagers the week before in a pot plantation argument that went badly. So to me, <clears throat> the cannabis movement for me is a criminal justice issue, it's a social justice issue. The war on drugs has been a disaster. It, it, the fact of the matter is a place like Humboldt County and other counties in California, there are people right now guarding cannabis gardens with machine guns. And if you are that unlucky person that goes out for a hike in a beautiful place, and you happen to be that unlucky person that stumbles upon a cannabis garden and armed individuals guarding that garden, you could die. And it could be on, on public lands. So to me, people with machine guns are not guarding cornfields or barley or hops or soy. They are guarding cannabis fields because it has been illegal for too long. And the war on drugs, you can't have a war on a plant. A war is on people and people get killed. And my sister got killed. So I hope you'll remember that people who are passionate about this usually have a story behind it as to why they're willing to kind of play in this gray area and take risks that we might not otherwise take. And, you know, if you look at a graph of the incarceration rate in the U.S., as soon as the war on drugs started by, I had, I'm not going to get political here, but by the Reagans in the 1980s, you see it literally just go straight up. In the 1980s, the prison population just went almost straight up. It's just a straight line up. And the saying is that we have 5% of the world's population here in the US, but we have 25% 
of the world's incarcerated people. That is a staggering statistic. We are supposedly the land of the free. This country has become the land of the locked up. And that's just, it's not okay. And a lot of that, the majority of that has to do with non-violent drug offenses of which cannabis is the large majority of that. It really has destroyed lives. Um, it certainly affected our family's life. I think that goes without saying. And uh, to see especially um, an inordinate amount of people of color being having their entire lives um, affected negatively because they are put in prison for possessing a plant. Um, so that's where my passion lies. It's kind of the underpinnings of why um, I, I like to do this. Um, so then back to the sterile part of it, I do a lot of um, uh, company formations in Humboldt County. Um, I try to help people who are willing to go legal get legal. Um, so I form a lot of limited liability companies and a lot of corporations and I give uh, people advice um, who are trying to start doing the right thing. I got involved back in 2010 and 11. Um, I served on the city of San Francisco's Medical Cannabis Task Force. Uh, we probably indirectly crossed paths back, back in the day. It was very bizarre to be sitting in a very um, ornate uh, room in, in downtown city hall of San Francisco with the mayor's office like one floor down and you know three offices over and we're sitting there talking about how we're you know need to normalize the cannabis rules in, in San Francisco and then hopefully um, Oakland will follow and then then go the state and then goes the nation. So I'll stop there. I, I appreciate your time in coming to uh, hear our stories. Thank you very much.